Thank you. Before we do citizen statements, I'd like to read a statement on behalf of the Board of Education. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight and for sharing your suggestions and concerns regarding school safety. We will respond to you in writing, and in the letter we will let you know that the board and, administra and administration have no intention of asking teachers to carry guns in school. We have discussed this several times with our law enforcement community, and the strong consensus is that arming teachers is not a good idea. But since you brought safety up, I would like to briefly let you know about some additional strategies we are considering to help improve the safety and security in our schools. As you know, we have armed police officers that we call SROs in all middle and high schools. The elementary schools share the SRO, share SROs, but we are having conversations with our law enforcement partners to see how, how hello? I think they're trying to tell me something. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. 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 Okay, good, thank you. As I was saying, we're having conversations with our law enforcement partners to see how we can get a more dedicated security presence at our elementary schools, particularly during arrival and dismissal times. I'd like to let you know some of the other things that are under consideration. Double entry security vestibules at all middle and high schools with more robust screening procedures before visitors are allowed through the second set of locked doors. An enhanced visitor management system requ requiring scanned ID checks. Expanding the ballistic security film on school entryway doors and windows. We already have this film on the main school entrances, but are looking to expand it to secondary entrances. Doubling the number of internal and external security cameras in our elementary schools. Extending the heights of wall and doors at the three remaining elementary schools that have the open classroom concept to improve life at security. Bell Reeve, Hannah Woods, and Run Hollow. Providing more training for teachers and staff to help them better identify students who might be having trouble or at risk of harming themselves or others. One more thing, better training of our staff about buzzing people in without proper ID. This is obviously a work in progress, and we will continue to make improvements in the interest of keeping all students and staff safe. With that, with that, I would like to thank you all again for attending tonight's meeting and sharing your message with us. I heard all the walkout activities in Parkway today were conducted in a respectful and peaceful manner by students. We appreciate that and are inspired by your des desire to join in the conversation about school safety. Thank you. I'm going to deviate from our usual order. We usually call citizen statements in the order that the people arrive. But we do have one citizen statement about gun violence prevention. So if you all don't mind, I'd like to call Zoe Rosenberg to the microphone. And, and as we usually do, we, we're going to um, limit our citizen statements to two minutes each. Thank you all for um, <clears throat> thank you all for allowing me to be here tonight. Um, with the statement that was just read, you actually answered a lot of points in my speech, so I'm going to be going a little bit off book tonight. Um, well, so Parkway School Board, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. As you can see with, with the beautiful signs and wonderful people who have come here with me tonight, gun violence is something that is at the forefront of people's minds. Um, my name is Zoe, and I'm a senior at Parkway Central, but I speak here tonight not from my own mind, but from the hearts of the over 7,000 students that have been murdered by preventable gun violence since Sandy Hook shocked our nation a mere five years ago. And I speak here for the 17 murdered last month in Parkland, and I speak on behalf of Parkway student population. As a student, I have the right to an education. I have the right to grow up, to learn, to speak, and to be safe. 
This district has provided me with all the tools I need to become the capable young adult I am today, and now I turn to give back to the district. And amidst the recent tragedy in Parkland and upcoming elections, there have been a lot of talks about different things to be doing around gun violence prevention. So on behalf of every student here, we would like to thank the school board for pledging to never arm teachers and everything else included in the statement. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was at the very core of our values to respond to these challenges, and the only way to respond to gun violence is to truly commit to the safety of our students. We can take these steps to face challenges by properly educating faculty and students about what to do in active shooter situations and gun violence in general. We also need to equip our schools with better safety measures, like having SROs at every elementary school, like you guys mentioned, and also by having inside locking doors in every classroom, and a single main and entry point for each school. Although these actions will cost a lot of money, they, do they really cost more than the lives of our children? Our district must show its care about it, their students, their children, and my friends. I want to feel safe at school, and it is Parkway's responsibility to make sure that every single child who passes through our schools is looked after. So it, I, think, I, I think that we've reached the two minutes, but thank you very much, and you'll receive a reply. Normally, we ask people to refrain from shows of emotion, but I understand emotions are running high on this issue, so I'm just going to let it go for this one time. Now, I'd like to move on to the others that have signed up to make citizen statements, but another brief statement uh, on behalf of the board, and that is, I see the other 11 citizens that have signed up all want to speak on the same topic. Unfortunately, it's a topic that we do not discuss publicly. As any one of us who are employees know, we don't want our personal employee issues discussed publicly. As um, public school employees, there are certain records that are made public, but there are certain things that are only discussed privately. And I think out of respect for those involved, if you want to still make a statement, you are welcome to do so with no identifiers. No school, no name. And if we can stick to that, those criteria, then you're welcome to come up and make your statements. Uh, Clay Stockwell. Oh, and, and you guys, we're, we're done with the applause. Okay, we get it, we're done with it. Okay, my name is Clay Stockwell. I reside at 633 Fox Hill Estates Drive in Baldwin, Missouri, 63021. Parkway School District has an excellent reputation, both in the state of Missouri and across the nation. And it resides within a very hardworking, well-educated community. It boasts having the best teachers, staff, and administrators, as well as a very strong and proactive board. And you all have helped Parkway get this great reputation. I think the strength of the, any district lies in its people. As you know, our school is part of Parkway. We, as parents, entrust our children with those teachers and administrators. That is why we're here tonight. Two, two days ago, we learned that Parkway will be hiring a new administrator at our school, and this will be the fourth in six years. As a parent, that is simply unacceptable to us and should be unacceptable to any school district. Uh, let alone Parkway. Now, how can we, as a community, expect any continuity, any consistency for our children and under these, under these circumstances? And each person here tonight has their own personal story. If you're with me, please rise. I ask you to listen as each of these short stories that come about, please remember what the true essence of being a true great leader is. It is being able to take a step back to evaluate a situation, reevaluate the situation, and make a decision that fits the greater good of the community. I encourage you, the Parkway Board of Educators, to listen to each of our stories as they represent a very small percentage of the community that has been positively impacted by administration during the last year and a half. As you can see, the support from our community is great because we care about our kids, our school, and the Parkway School District.
Our goal tonight is not to question anyone's authority or to discuss pers personnel issues, but simply for the board to have the benefit of listening to our constituents so they together can pay the way. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the other speakers, when the microphone goes quiet, that means your two minutes are up. Johnny Wang. My name is Johnny Wang. I live at 818 Clintwood Court. I'm the father of three boys in the district. One of them is with me today. I'm a graduate of Parkway South in 98, South Junior in 94, and Wren Hollow in 92. I'm here to show appreciation to the board for passing board policy KB.BP in 2006, which states that Parkway should work with families. It also states that this board would implement strategies to involve parents collaboratively in decisions that affect the education of their children. In 2008, this board mandated in policy KCB.BP that community involvement in the decision-making process is essential. The board policy also requires involving parents and other citizens in the decision-making process in order to develop expanded ownership through involvement of persons affected by decisions. Needless to say, the administrative leadership of an elementary school and any change with such leadership is a decision that directly impacts the education and well-being of our children. I have to ask you, are we truly prioritizing our children by disrupting the continuity of leadership at this school once again? Four times in six years. Look around this room. I and the over 500 community members who have signed the petition ask you to follow your policies, hear our voices, and collaborate with us in this decision. Day in and day out, we breathe and live this school. I think we have some insight into what's best for the school. These kids deserve continuity, and they deserve someone who has proven to be the right fit for the job already. Thank you. You guys. I'm going to end the statements if you keep clapping, okay? I'm serious. It's our meeting. We have a lot to get to tonight, and that just takes up time. Uh, Jessica Papillo. Hello. Thank you uh, for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Jessica Papillo. I'm from uh, 1521 Strawberry Glen Court. And um, tonight I just wanted to tell you a story, a story about a young boy and an administrator. Um, this administrator came into his life in first grade, and this young boy has some special needs. Um, he's an SSD student, and this administrator came to every one of his IEP needs, and she came as a collaborator as a person who wanted to help him meet his educational needs. This administrator made a huge impact in his life. This administrator continues to follow him as he moves on to his middle school career, checking in regularly, asking how he's doing. This administrator cares deeply about her community. This administrator cares deeply about the parents in the community as well. The administrator came into the school when it seemed to be in crisis. There was a lot going on that parents didn't support. And the administrator came in and created an environment that was inclusive, not only to this little boy who had special needs, but to every student that walked through that door. And that means the world to us. So I'm asking tonight that you support this administrator and you support all of the students in that building as that building continues to make changes and improve the school climate for the future of our kids. Thank, Thank you. you. Deirdre Jones. I'm Deidre Jones and I reside at 816 Conestoga Drive in Baldwin and I have Olivia Fields with me tonight. Thank you, Parkway Board of Education, for the work that you do for our kids. I'm beyond grateful for your service and contributions to our leaders of tomorrow. I'm here tonight because I want to highlight the opportunity that I see in front of each of you. It is an opportunity to hear the voice of a community 
and work collaboratively, collaboratively with parents to improve the education of our kids. When I think about Parkway and why I love it so much, I'm happy to tell you that it always comes back to the people. It's the people who make the school, the district, the community what it is. The best facilities, mission statements, opportunities, they're just that, they're extras, they're the cherry on top. In my mind, these things mean very little without the people. People are the cornerstone of any highly successful entity. How lucky are we to finally be blessed with just that? We are proud to have the best of the best when it comes to administrative leaders in our school. We've been blessed with a person who clearly has an unwritten mission statement to have a personal relationship and connection with every child, every family, every staff member, a person who relates to our sensory children in an uncomparable way, a person who for once in a long time has the very best interest of all our kids, our staff, our community at heart, which is attributable to decades long and highly reputable history and reputation in our area of the district. Most importantly, we've finally been blessed with a consistency and continuity that has long been absent, that has helped staff and parents once again find confidence in the work that is currently happening and will continue for the coming years. As I reflect back on my belief that it's the people who make a school what it is, I know the Parkway School District that I so dearly admire also values people in the same way. They're a valued and integral part of all that we do in this ever-evolving world of elementary and secondary education. Can I give Olivia a minute to say what she would like to say? We didn't register our minors. Go ahead, babe. Uh, I really love my principal. I'm sorry, we, we're gonna cut this short. Okay. We, we're not identifying anybody. Okay, okay. she wasn't sure how I'm else sorry. to refer to. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, babe. You know, we're gonna stick with the everybody okay. deserves to have their privacy. Brian. Thank you. No problem. I went to Parkway my whole life and I had the same problem. Okay. Well, you know what? The problem right. the problem is actually my eyesight. I guess I could make it make it a little bigger. Okay. No worries. My name is Brian Batchelor. My wife Angela and I. We live at 729 Rosehaven Court in Baldwin, Missouri, 63021. I graduated from Parkway North in 1989, went to Parkway East before that, and Craig School. I grew up in Parkway. I've always lived in Parkway. I'm also a board member for the Junior Patriots football program. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. What I want to talk about is the future. The future are our kids. That is all we should be worried about. That is all the sole focus of everything that we've been thinking about for the past week, as I'm sure some of you have been. With that in mind, how are we gonna give our kids the best future possible? By providing strong, consistent leadership that entails love, empathy, and is an inspiration to all. Our community is here. Obviously, you have seen this. When I think of what Parkway is, this is what Parkway is to me. Parkway means a little bit different to everybody else. You have high school students here, you have teachers here. But when we think about how great Parkway is and why we love it, it is because of this. This is what makes Parkway. For all of these parents to come together to support someone who has supported our children and treated them better than we probably treat our own children. In all honesty, just as you board members want and expect the very best for your children, by sitting in that seat, our children become your children. So let's share this responsibility together. Please hear our voices understand our daily experiences in our local school and community to make the right choices. We are a designated sensory school. Our student population is peppered with children on the spectrum who every day deal with behavioral and emotional issues. Our administration embraces these kids and demands that the student body does also. With that, uh, sorry Annalise. She's been incredibly impacted by the local, by the recent administration. Todd Birkenholtz. Good evening, board. My name is Todd Birkenholtz. Um, I live at 1412 Cedar Bluff Drive in the 63021. The most important resource in any organization is its people. 
from multinational corporations to sports teams to the mom and pop store down the street to the Parkway School District, it's the people who make all the difference. And when you're fortunate enough to not only identify great people, but also match them with an opportunity to be extraordinarily impactful within their community, that's a powerful synergy. Our elementary school community has thrived in such an environment over the last year and a half after a considerable period of unprecedented turnover, turmoil, and instability within our building's top administration. Over the last year and a half, our new administration has championed a culture of leadership through patience, compassion, support, and kindness, which has translated into a more cohesive group of teachers, happier students, and more engaged parents and families. It is a wonderful feeling every time you walk into the building. This is the Parkway we know and love, and we are fully invested in our community. We urge the Board of Education to not accept the resignation of our administrator. We urge the board to consider the ripple effect that this decision will again have on our community and exercise their discretion and reason to take a closer look at the circumstances. Decisions that ultimately affect our children should not be made hastily nor in a vacuum. And we urge you, our elected representation, to do what we as parents and so many of our wonderful Parkway teachers do every single day with our most precious resource, our children, find a win-win. Our community cannot afford to take another step backward, destroy our building's momentum, and deplete its morale. We cannot hit the reset button and hope things are gonna be okay. We deserve better, and our children most certainly deserve better. Amy Moransky. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy Moransky of 850 Spring Hill Farm Drive. My children and I have been part of the wonderful Parkway community for 15 years. In our family, the words Parkway mean learning, values, and concern for quality education for all students. A big problem that we faced were those years of inconsistency in a particular school's administration. My youngest had three different principals in six years, and this caused a great deal of turmoil among the students, the staff, and the parent volunteers in the community. Over those years of revolving administrators, I worked with them regarding differentiated learning for my particular child and expanding extracurricular STEM programs that I've been running for the last 15 years. During the last year of one administration, no one wanted to make changes or consider new ideas because a new administration was coming. During that next admin's first year, they often expressed to me that they wanted to change little and observe. This is understandable for a new administrator, but it meant that the kids were in a two-year holding pattern. Two years in the life of an elementary student is an eternity, as we all know. After that, they implemented many changes with varying success. They were just beginning to hit their stride when they left quite abruptly. The next administrator hit the ground running. But again, every decision had to be reconsidered and reworked. Now this year, when they are truly hitting their stride, this administration is in jeopardy. I don't want these children that I love so much, everybody here can tell you that, to experience the same upheaval that we did. There was a smooth transition last time because this current administrator already knew the school and more importantly, is a strong and capable leader. The next set of administrators will not have that experience and as we've learned, there is no guarantee that the candidate who is selected will be that oh so important, strong and capable leader. The children of Parkway need consistency and I truly hope that the Board of Education. Thank you. Keith Clear. Hi, my name uh, is Keith Clear. My wife and I, uh, my, wife. my wife Laura and I live at 1373 Westbrook Meadows Lane. Um, we have a first grader, Abby, and a fourth grader, Will, in the district. Um, as we were searching for a new area in St. Louis to live, uh, Parkway was on the top of our list when we moved from the city. My son's first year coincided with the change in administrations. We were very happy with the school at the time, but always seemed like something was missing. Well, that was this administration. That's what was missing. Didn't think I'd get like this. Okay. On a daily basis, the current administration shows our community that they not only invested in our kids, but in their lives. 
when we talk about community, with our, everybody's busy lives, it's easy to forget as parents, we are part of a small community that are connected through our kids' school. My wife and I have seen our children blossom in this school. Okay, now I'm just... This strengthening community did not happen by chance. It happened because this administration worked long hours to create an environment, not only in our school, but in our community as a whole. This environment is noticed the second you walk into the building. I tell my kids all the time, always surround yourself with good people. They are surrounded with good people right now. So I ask you to reconsider your decision. Thank you. Cassandra Saxon. My name is Cassandra Saxon. My family and I live at 1515 Rosewood Terrace Drive, 63021. Um, I have a high schooler and a middle schooler. Um, I want to talk to you about consistency. Um, Dr. T. Barry Brazelton died yesterday at the age of 99. He was known particularly for a series of books on developmental milestones in children that he called touch points. Touch points are moments when children are on the cusp of a great leap, such as walking, learning to read, or mastering the concept of multiplication. Some children regress by lashing out at peers or teachers due to frustration before achieving a touch point. Originally, Dr. Brazelton thought touch points were achieved in the first three years of life, but later he realized they spanned your entire life cycle. Dr. Brazelton's focus was to help parents anticipate and understand their child's touch points so they could help their children to be successful. Other caregivers in a child's life are the scaffolding to support both the parent and the child. This scaffolding is made up of people that form bonds with the child and his or her family. School administrators are the most important part of a child and parent's scaffolding. They interact with a child almost every day, some child more than others. They are also a witness to the struggles leading up to a child's touch points, and thus they also experience the regressions. These administrators need to be consistent in order to form a strong scaffolding and work towards Parkway's goals of producing curious, caring, and confident learners. Please help us keep consistency for our children. Please don't let the fear of public perception steer you away from your goals. The people in this room today are your public. Thank you. Jerry Hershaw. Jerry Persia, I'm from 1427 Westbrook Terrace Drive. I actually had a little bit longer speech prepared, but then I had to take my daughter to gymnastics tonight. She goes three nights a week, and it's my time to spend with her. We have about 20 minutes to a half an hour, depending on traffic, and that's my time alone to talk with her. And I had to explain to her what was going on. And it was hard to explain things in adult terms to her, so what I told her was, Pretend that it was bedtime and you asked for a couple cookies. And I said, all right, two cookies. That's all you get tonight before bedtime. And when I went over to the cookie jar later on, all the cookies were gone. I immediately thought she took all the cookies and ate all the cookies. So I approached her and I said, you ate all the cookies, so this weekend you're grounded. She said, that's not fair. Later on, I find out from my wife that there was only two cookies left in the jar. Now, do I keep her grounded or do I let her go? There was nothing that was done wrong in the situation. There was no penalties assessed for this woman, a passionate woman who's there all the time. Every time I go to that school, she's there. And I don't think it's fair that when someone is exonerated that we continue to hold them accountable. She needs to be freed of this situation and we need to move on. Thank you. 
Jackie Paulus. Polis. My name is Jackie Paulus, and I live at 549 Treetop Trail Drive. I had a little bit different speech prepared. Um, I was going to remind you of the seven habits. I'm here to be proactive. I want to try and do something. I have been um, part of the Parkway family since my little one was in kindergarten. He's now 15. I have been through quite a few administrators. I've tried with each administrator. I have been a PTO president through several administrators. I'm one of the first to call and ask you to consider my opinion, and it has always been considered, and I've always appreciated that. This past administration, I was the first one to call Desi and ask him to consider a certain someone for this position. Sorry. I was hoping to be the first to ask for you to reconsider. Sadly, I have a horrible feeling that this might be the last time I speak to any of you. Because if this administration is going to change once again, I feel very strongly that it is time for my family to move on. But we can't do it again. I don't have it in me. My kids don't have it in them. It's been too much. It's been way too much. And to finally have been settled and happy, and my kids are happy, and we have stayed for a long time because the teachers have been amazing. We haven't stayed for the administration until now. But if this is going to go down the way it's going down, I'm not going down with it. Thank you. Everybody that spoke will get a reply in writing. I was neglectful and neglected 6.0 additions, corrections, and modifications to the agenda. 6.01 addendum to agenda item 10.08 approval of personnel items. So we've had 7.0. I'm going to take a brief break in case anybody wants to get on with their evening, and we will reconvene in five minutes.
we're going to start our meeting again. <laughs> Can everybody who's staying please take your seats? 8.0, approval of agenda, March 14th, 2018. May I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda for the regular meeting of the Board of Education scheduled on March 14th, 2018. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. 9.0, communications. Excuse me just a minute. Thank you. 9.01, calendar of meetings. The next regular board meeting will take place on Wednesday, April 11, 2018, beginning at 7 p.m. at Central Middle School. Any anticipated closed session will be held at 6 o'clock p.m. The annual organizational meeting will be held at 6.30 p.m. on April 11, 2018. 9.02 board candidate filing. Individuals who have filed for a board seat are in order of filing and please stand as I call your name. Jeannie Ames, Kevin Seltzer, oh he's outside, Jonathan Taylor, Matthew Schindler, Amy Bonnet. The election will be held on April 3rd, 2018. 9.02, board liaison reports. We'll start down with Sudhir and work this way. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a student services subcommittee meeting. Uh, Christy Klein Davis and myself attended at the ISC with Dr. Gina Puccini and Dr. Charlotte EJ. And you know, just for the record, we have been discussing a lot of stuff such as you know, the student service, uh, the gaps between certain students and how we can bring them up to the speed and also focusing on how we can get them ready for their college. So we are really trying to focus on each and every individual, see where there is a need and then we focus more on the student services. Thank you. I attended the special school district governing council meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> the, the primary purpose of that particular meeting was to approve the board of directors for the special school district. We could not come to consensus on one of the sub-districts and as a result of that, the special school district will have to go back through the uh, election process to find candidates to bring uh, back to the governing council. Uh, so that was our, our big thing for that evening. I also attended the religious leaders meeting uh, last week with um, Mr. Todd and Dr. Marty um, and Annie Dickerson. That was a wonderful meeting to, um, to talk about with our religious leaders and calendars and it's always great to get their input as we want to be respectful of everyone's religion. Um, I also want to um, give a thank you for preparation for tonight's board meeting. As board members, we have a due diligence to make sure that what we're approving on the agenda um, are things that we agree with and that we have answers for if we are asked by the community why we voted certain ways. There were a number of matters on tonight's agenda that I had numerous questions Unfortunately, my time did not allow me to get to this until um, the other day, and so my questions were produced at late notice. So I wanted to give a huge thank you to the administrators that worked very hard to provide answers uh, before tonight's meeting so that I could feel comfortable in approving what was on tonight's agenda. And those in particular include Brian Whittle, Patty Bedborough, Gina Pacini, Charlotte E.J., Mike Roth, Amy Joyce, and Eric Luters. And thank you to Nikki Stover for forwarding all that information so that as a board member we can do our due, our due diligence. Uh, this evening we had the wonderful opportunity of recognizing Teachers of the Year. And um, this is always a very, very pleasant experience for us as board members to recognize teachers, great teachers. And we know that this is just a sample 
of all the teachers in this district that are truly outstanding. Very giving, very caring, very loving, and do all they possibly can for their children, their students. So first of all, thank you to the Alumni Association for hosting the reception. It's fun to meet everyone, and it's also fun to recognize these wonderful teachers, and there's so many more out in the classrooms every day that I hope someone is saying thank you. Okay, um, I had the chance to do a couple of visits, um, visit a couple of programs I hadn't yet seen over the since our last meeting. Um, one was a visit to Fern Ridge. Um, one of the counselors, Dr. Flagg, gave me a tour, um, walked me through, talked about the program. It was really great. Um, just good to learn more and hear about it and get to engage with some of the students there. Um, and I also visited the Early Childhood Center. Um, Dr. Amaralt gave me a tour of that facility um, and really looked at some of the kind of inclusive practices and some of those classes that are combined classrooms and some of the great work that they're doing um, to work with kiddos through our Early Childhood Program at the Early Childhood Center. Um, also got to go to the Students Demand Action Press Conference um, that was planned by some of the same students that were outside today. Um, Beth and Jeff were there as well and got to hear them. That was on the 23rd of February, really kind of put together an event and get attention for it um, and do a really, I think, great professional and respectful job of working to make their voices heard. Um, and last Friday, attended the government relations meeting, which I have to say was the most um, exciting Enter government relations Enter meeting that I have been to entertaining at Parkway. Um, we had several state elected officials there as well as representatives from some of our um, congressional and senate offices. And the topic of the day was vouchers and some of the voucher bills that are going on. And I, I think we got a little sense of the conversations that are happening across our state and happening in Jeff City um, at, our, at our meeting. So it was actually quite interesting, good to hear. Um, in a, in a good meeting, so and that was combined with some um, groups from Pattonville, so the Pattonville board and so state reps from from that area as well. Well, I'm a slacker because I didn't attend that many things. Uh, thank, you. I, thank you, <laughs> I, and I know that they attended this as well. So um, I was honored to attend the West High, West Middle and West High band um, presentation or band concert this past week. And it's always amazing to hear the change when they're playing as sixth graders and you get to hear the sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth grade, on, on up. It's just amazing the progression. And as a band parent myself, it was really an honor to see a drum line because unfortunately when my kids were there, they, didn't, they weren't large enough for a drum line, didn't have enough. And it was really exciting to hear a drum line. They did a great job. So. Uh, in addition to uh, the, the couple of things that um, Debbie and Christy mentioned that I joined them at, uh, also got to visit the, uh, the STEM Fest that we had at Southwest Middle a few weeks ago. And just uh, it was pretty amazing to see the kids uh, working with all sorts of different uh, things from, from art things to uh, science things. And uh, I got to drive a robot. Uh, that, was, that was the highlight of my afternoon. Uh, and got to see some of the science fair exhibits, the Parkway Science Fair uh, exhibits that were, some of which were judged by our own high school students. Um, and I was talking to a couple of them that got to participate in judging, and I've been judging the Greater St. Louis Science Fair for a number of years, and, and just the passion in their voices talking about science and, and being able to, to be kind of a mentor to these younger kids in, in uh, reviewing the projects was neat. Um, I also was invited to South Middle's Genius Hour, uh, where I met Nyla Bonner, uh, who created a program to bring music to kids in hospitals. And she spent a few minutes telling me about this program that she's developed, and she's going to Children's Hospital and, and sharing different types of music with kids that, that can't get out of the hospital. So um, that was really neat. She did a great job. Uh, also attended Bell Reeves Leadership Day, and that was impressive to see all the young leaders that we have in, in that school that are, that are so like a lot of our other schools. Um, but just the, the care and the pride that they have in their school uh, really meant a lot to me to see. Um, and then I'd just like to say I, I think we had a, a great turnout uh, a couple of nights ago for the candidate forum. I thought it was uh, a very nice event put on by the League of Women Voters, as usual. Uh, and a, a great, uh, great set of questions, and I know Dr. Marty's got those questions now, and uh, we'll be, we'll be using those to kind of, kind of improve ourselves as we go forward. So. 
I just want to add one thing to what Christy said about the um, government relations meeting the other day. It was interesting to kind of get an insider's view of how the legislators interact when they disagree. So we had some pretty passionate um, speeches about the plus, the pros and the cons of vouchers. And it was so interesting to me that the legislators spoke to each other so respectfully, and then they kind of butt, butt heads kind of disrespectfully, and then all of a sudden that was over and they were back to respecting each other. So it was just a little glimpse uh, um, uh, into what goes on in Jefferson City, and I think what it demonstrated to me is everybody's passionate, everybody thinks that they're doing the best that they can do for their constituents, just like I think that we all work hard and we're all passionate about what we do, and, and I think each and every one of us think that we're doing the best job that we can for our constituents. So it was just kind of an interesting parallel for me. Okay, let's see. Oh, yes, go ahead. I just want to comment. I just want to thank the board again for um, attending activities and going to visit some programs. I have to tell you, uh, they're very, very appreciative because I hear it. They'll, they'll, they'll email me and say, you wouldn't believe who is here. <laughs> and so uh, thanks for the effort. Uh, it really makes a lot of difference for uh, the schools and your interests. It's really very much valued, so thank you. Uh, board subcommittee reports, there are none tonight. In upcoming subcommittee meetings, the TLA subcommittee will meet at 4.30 p.m. on Wednesday, April 4th at Parkway's Administrative Center. Details of the meeting will be posted within 24 hours of the anticipated meeting. 10.0 consent items. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented in the April 11, 2018 board materials? Is there anything that needs to be pulled to action or closed? I need to abstain from 10.07, please. I'd like to abstain from line 168 from consent item 10.08. Okay, um, except for those two abstentions, um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0, except the two abstentions. Thank you. 11.0, action items. We're all looking forward to hearing from Patty Badborough about the approval of CARE ATC for our health care clinic. Thank you very much, and we are very excited to tell you more about the healthcare clinic as well. I want to start this evening by thanking both Amy Joyce and Brian Whittle for joining me on this journey in researching the different clinics, etc., cetera, um, and also from the members of our employee groups that went on tour with us to the different clinics as we um, viewed the different sites. Um, as you know, um, we started this journey quite a while ago um, going, gosh, I think it's now the year before last, with the feasibility study. Um, since then, um, we have done, of course, our employee survey that um, we gave both the results of the feasibility study and that employee survey to you last June at our board retreat. Uh, since then, we agreed on partnering with both the Francis Howe School District and the Pattonville School District in opening the clinics. And the big why on that is we share areas that are very common where we live and where we work. Part of the feasibility study showed us that um, we would have better economies of scale if we shared a clinic versus opening one up just solely for us as well. Um, so we started this process more in, with more in depth with doing an RFP with our insurance broker, which is J.W. Terrell. We reviewed all the submissions. Um, we did interviews, ROI analysis, which we'll go a little bit more in depth, site visits, our final decision um, to one provider, which tonight I'd like to um, recommend that it is Care ATC. Um, and we'll go through why that decision was made. Um, we presented our recommendation last week to our benefit committee, our district benefit committee, and they did um, recommend that we proceed with this clinic as well. And so tonight we're here seeking your approval. 
So start with the why. Why are we pursuing a, a clinic? Well, certainly we know that here in Parkway, we do have an extensive employee wellness program. But with anything else, we know that we can get better. And a, a wellness clinic or a healthcare clinic will, will help us in our efforts to improve our employee wellness. We'll improve the potential of better health outcomes for our employees and our dependents that are on the plan. We hope to have a, a convenient, a quality health care uh, provider for our employees. This provider would be able to address acute medical care issues, improved experience, which includes both the waiting time and the care that they receive um, at the clinic, anticipated reduction in sick leave time. Uh, currently, a lot of our certified staff have to take um, a half day off as a minimum for um, doctor's visits currently. So we wanna work on improving that so they're away from the classroom for less time. Of course, there's long-term savings and cost avoidance to our healthcare plan, which of course then feeds into goal three objectives of Project Park way and long-term cost efficiency as well as wellness enhancement for our employees and the members on our plan. So first a review of what our survey from our employees and retirees said. Um, they said please do not make a site on Parkway property. They felt there, were, there was a potential for feeling that there would be privacy issues there. So um, they recommended that we have a site that was within five to 10 miles of where they were. They were okay with having a nurse practitioner model or a medical doctor model. So we are moving forward with a recommendation of a medical doctor model. Um, they'd be willing to go to this clinic if they had reduction in their copay costs. So we are working on um, building the plan that with the base and the premium plan, there would be zero copays um, as part of the incentive to go to the healthcare clinic. On the high deductible plan, there is an IRS ruling that we're required to at least charge a de minimis amount. So that's um, we need to work on whether or not that's $25 or $35 a visit. Um, of course, that is a savings to the employee versus going to a regular practitioner. Um, they would currently pay the United Healthcare cost of the contract cost of about $65 to $90 per visit. So certainly having a $25 or $35 um, payment is much cheaper. And we currently use um, sick time uh, um, to access the health care with that half day minimum. In the feasibility study, um, and remember that was completed through Mercer, which uh, we had a partnership through Business Health Coalition where three of us actually did the uh, feasibility study. It was ourselves, Francis Howe School District, and the Bi-State Development Agency. Um, they, as a result of that feasibility study, when they looked at just Parkway data, they said the cost plus model would provide a higher return on investment, um, that the capitated cost model would be more expensive for the district and we wouldn't have a return on investment as quickly. Partnering with another entity would improve our outcomes with the economies of scale and modeling um, our experience based on 25% participation the first year with 5% increases in each subsequent year. So certainly um, estimates that would be doable and not outrageous. So before we really um, dug into it, three school districts decided what our goals for the health care clinic would be because we thought we need to narrow down those goals before we dive in so we can narrow our for focus. So certainly quality health care for our employees and dependents on the plan. Convenient location that eases scheduling, access to the doctor, and flexible hours. Those were all very important for us. Wellness, um, a robust health risk assessment, 
biometrics that's actually a vein draw versus just a fingerprint, and then personalized coaching available from the healthcare provider. Um, the provider that's familiar with our plans and goals, so uh, versus your, your primary care physician now that deals with numerous plans, we could have a provider that could be focused simply on our three plans or one other employer or two other employers' plans, very plan specific versus extremely broad. We would also look um, at the provider that will treat and manage chronic diseases such as high blood pressure, diabetes, um, and weight loss. Provider that will look at that whole picture of, of member wellness and not just what they were addressing at the visit, meaning they were in there maybe with a cold or a cough. Um, but then they could look up on the medical record and see that they hadn't been on, in there recently for their wellness visit. So while they're there, they could actually schedule that wellness visit as well. So looking at that whole uh, person concept. And the provider that will refer to specialists only when needed in the decision actually based on quality metrics and not necessarily just a relationship or a partnership. So then we have quality care that's guaranteed to our employees and members. Overall, the goal is improved experience for the member. So we had eight respondents to the RFP. We interviewed five, um, and I know we went through this at our retreat in January, so I won't go into much detail. Our final considerations were both CARE ATC and CARE HERE. Um, CARE ATC um, is a model that um, is a cost pass-through, so an actual cost, um, has several locations, not only in St. Louis, but also around the U.S that would be open for our employees and dependents to, um, to visit. They have a very detailed implementation plan. It was the medical doctor model. Um, and data integration was already set up with United Healthcare, so it would feed into their electronic medical record. Biometric screening, once that was done, there was actually an enhanced video that would be sent to um, the member um, with the outcomes from their actual screening. So telling them their ranges of their, their blood pressure, um, where their blood sugars fell, what are some warning signs um, or conditions that um, could apply. So uh, no cost to building of sites, so that was very important as well. So our location for Parkway um, would be, that's located in Parkway, would be right on Ballast Road, kind of in between Olive Road and Ladue Road, so kind of across from the bread company, if you will, in a bank of doctor's buildings, so it'll look just like a doctor's office, has that look, that feel, everything else. Um, of course, our members would be able to visit the other locations that one will be located in Pattonville, another one will be located in the Francis House School District if everything is approved, and there's already one that is established in St. Peter's as well. We know that Care ATC is very data driven and they had a better return on investment than um, Care Here did. Um, the cons, we did have um, one con with the current location. There was a turnover of a doctor, but he's been there for almost six years now. So that was early on when the um, facility opened. We also looked at care here. So care here is physically located in a building in the city of St. Charles School District. Um, they would, they do have more school district specific experience than what care ATC has, um, but they do have flexibility reporting um, we would have needed a higher utilization for the return on investment to actually be positive so it would have been closer to a 50% utilization for us to have a positive return on investment um, they have also offered the MD model the physician dash dashboard and then if we would have signed a five-year agreement they would have had zero build-out costs for us now this is a model so part of the cons it was based on cap capitated fees meaning a per member per month fee um, so that was a much higher um, cost than the actual cost uh, model from care ATC 
Uh, they currently do have two lawsuits against them. And then the current location in St. Charles did have um, three um, nurse practitioners. So they had um, two very quick turnovers, and now this current employee that's running the clinic has been there for over a year. So our final factors are, I guess, factors that influence the return on investment certainly is cost and utilization of the, the uh, medical care in the community. So if we're in a community that has extensive offerings, then people have a lot of choices. So we got to make sure that what we're offering is a cost benefit to our employees and members. Utilization of the health care center, the more volume that we have, the better outcomes that we'll have as far as the ROI as well. So efficient management of operations and costs. We want to have optimal staffing. So um, CARE ATC does have extensive ex um, experience with staffing um, their, their clinics. So they are nationwide already. They have a model for every 1,500 um, employees. Then that's enough to staff a member. Um, redirection of appropriate levels of care, so ensuring that our referrals to in-network um, doctors, they're more cost-effective and high-quality providers, so ensuring that competitive management fees, and then also looking at replacement of existing services. So costs that we're currently um, bearing now would be replaced with other costs through the clinic. We want to enhance the management of chronic diseases. That's one of our focal points with this. Um, we know that um, based on our, our annual review with United Healthcare, we have several employees that do not even take advantage of the annual physical. We know with um, ACA that that's offered for zero cost through all of our our our, host, our uh, healthcare plans as part of the mandate, but even with it being at no cost, we still have several employees that don't take advantage of that. So part of our target would be to target them and make sure that they are able to attend the clinic and proactive engagement based on health data. So as we're getting um, as they're getting data from the wellness visits, then to proactive manage um, diseases. So we know nationwide we have a wide occurrence of diabetics and pre-diabetics, so to identify them early, change habits, um, certainly gives us better outcomes. And then use of evidence-based standards of care. So when we uh, looked at the return on investment, uh, this was completed by uh, JW Terrell. So they looked at our claims data versus the, the cost savings from the clinic, so the actual cost from the clinic. They also looked at um, other costs such as co soft costs, so savings on um, some of the uh, lost time from employees and turnover, meaning you know, we, we feel like this is an employee benefit that will further attract employees to remain here and retain here. Um, so part of those factors all went into this. <clears throat> and for Parkway, even in year one, we have a return on investment of 1.21 projected. So that means for every $1 that we spend on the clinic, we would have a return of $1.21. So essentially a plus 21 cents. So not all of that will be realized in the health care plan. Some of that will be realized as either a soft cost or into the district, um, less use of subs, for example. So what are our next steps? Certainly we, we received the benefit committee recommendation. We're asking you for your consideration tonight. And then um, once approved, we would go into negotiations with the clinic directly for our contract. Of course, communicate, communicate, communicate with our employees and our dependents. And then um, our hopes, our guide, is to have an opening of the clinic September 1st. Um, we know that Pattonville approved um, Carry TC last night at their board meeting and Francis Howell. Uh, this is an item on their board tomorrow night. So, any questions? I have just one thing. <laughs> um, I'm glad we're doing this. I think what we're seeing in the healthcare world is we need to try more different things like that. Um, you, Missouri State actually announced something like this last week. Um, I think we're seeing more and more of this pop up across the country. 
the one thing, I'm, it was helpful that you just said the soft cost factored into that ROI, because it just feels a little aggressive, especially in year one. I hope you're right. <laughs> um, from what I've read and seen, it feels aggressive for year one. I think it'll still be a positive ROI, but you know, it's a three-year contract, right? Correct. Well, we would look at it um, probably as a minimum of three okay. years. Um, we do want language specifically in there that if the relationship is not working, that we would be able to um, escape, <laughs> you know, or, you know, um, leave it. Um, so, yes, that would be our initial term, I believe. And I think the important thing is that it does take time. So, you know, I wouldn't want to take that escape route too fast, just to get people used to trying something new and different, especially with a healthcare provider, which is a big deal to people. It, it just takes a little time. So mm -hmm. I I think this is great. Um, I, I think one of the benefits is that the Patty's been working really closely with our employee groups, and I think that you know, it's a good start. I think they're very much endorsing this. <clears throat> so, you, you know, I think you're right. I mean, it's yeah. going to take some time. But the positive thing, and th this is not a top-down. This has been very collaborative, yep. and, and our employee groups have been communicating and very, very excited about this opportunity. So I think it's great. I'm glad we're doing it. Um, but It does have expandable um, ads, if you will. So if we see that we need a physical therapist added mm -hmm. or if we need time with even a mental health professional, we could flexibly add those into one or all the locations as well. A um, couple of questions is, will there be follow-up survey with employees to monitor their satisfaction? With Absolutely. That's one of my first questions. So I believe there's going to be surveys following visits as well. So that'll be something that is provided with their system, if I'm recalling this correctly. If not, then we certainly would survey our employees on that because uh, satisfaction is um, is part of the whole selling point of this model is to some, you know, um, I know recently I had bronchitis. My doctor didn't even want to see me. He just sent me prescriptions because he's like, don't even come in my office. But I know if I would have, I would have probably had to wait a day, wait probably an hour or so in his office and then get a prescription from another location. So part of the benefits of this healthcare clinic is you could schedule online, um, you would have a specific time slot, um, and the appointments are very well timed that there would be minimal waiting in a waiting room. Um, and for most prescriptions, they could actually pick those up at the same location. So that was one of the benefits of having the MD model. So we could dispense medications um, at the facility as well. And the cost of those um, medications would come through um, to us as an actual cost, so an actual wholesale price cost and not a retail cost of the pharmaceutical. Thank you. And then my second question, and, and thank you also for meeting with me. You and Brian met with me and gave me a little briefing about this. So that, that was very helpful. So I appreciate all the effort that you and the benefits team have been doing to make sure that this is um, an optimal benefit for our employees, not a duplication of services, but another benefit for them. Um, and then my, my last question is, um, since this is a collaboration, how, how is the agreement going to work between three school districts and say, if we're not happy, then how do we get out and these other two are still left and what are the ramifications and what are our um, you know, claims against anything happening if we want to get out and they still want to stay in? What's our obligations to that? That's a perfect question and we just had a, a follow-up phone call, I believe it was two weeks ago now, um, and that was part of our discussions with CARE ATC on that and we will actually have three separate agreements with um, CARE ATC. So we would be able to maneuver in and out of the agreement if necessary and we wouldn't necessarily hurt the whole of the plan. Um, originally, we were thinking that we had to create kind of like a trust um, between the three school districts and then manage one contract, but because Carrie TC is already a multi-employer um, setup, um, they actually just do it as 
individual contracts. Yep. The other benefit is both Pattonville and ourselves deal with the same legal firm, so we can share the legal costs um, because our, our agreements may look very much alike. So then on the flip side of that, if, if one of these other two or both of the other districts wanted to pull out, but we wanted to stay in, that we would still be able Correct. to do that? Correct. Absolutely. So one of the benefits of, of really doing this RFP together was to most likely drive down the cost of the whole implementation and the admin fees that go along with this. So it gave us better buying power on the, um, on the review site and on the cost site. So will that change if anybody pulls out? Um, I'm sure we will work through that in the language, but based on the conversations, um, it seemed like it was it was independent of each other. Okay, and then would there be opportunity for other schools to participate then yes. if they pulled out and, yeah. Yes, well even if they don't pull so out, don't. there's still opportunities so. to expand with other mm -hmm. school districts. Okay. Um, and not just school districts, so they're currently working with another employer that may open locations, um, I believe, in the South County area and um, a little bit more central St. Louis area. So our employees would be able to utilize all the locations, so not just one location. But we do have the benefit of one location being in our district. Thank you. You're welcome. Betty, you had mentioned that we have some number of people that don't participate in the wellness have we been tracking that, and is that number going up or down? And I assume we'll be tracking it going forward with the opening of this. So I did not bring that data with me, but I do know as far as participation in a lot of our wellness um, efforts, um, even in our, our wellness credit that we give, the $100 incentive that we give on a regular basis, the participation in that has gone down um, steadily over the last two years. So not remarkably lower, but um, certainly they feel the $100 incentive isn't enough for them to do everything that's required, which is a simple either wellness visit with a biometric screening, so with a doctor, or visiting our, well, our health clinics and just getting the little finger prick as um, a biometric screening along with proof that they've at least participated in one wellness event. So certainly not strenuous um, or um, long on the obligations. So um, we're hoping this boosts participation. So has this kind of existed there before? And is it, in other words, can anyone on, walk in off the streets to this clinic? So no, only members, Okay. only members. So we would also utilize this clinic for some of our employer costs as well. So we have pre-employee physicals for some of our employee groups, including bus drivers. We also have some vaccine, vaccines that are required for our maintenance um, generalists and for plumbers and for our food service workers. So we'd be able to utilize the services provided there um, for a lower cost to obtain uh, those services as well. So but no, they do have to show proof of being on one of our plans. So. Uh, this clinic provide all the services that an urgent care would provide? X-rays, uh, that kind of thing? So currently, X-rays is not part of the plan. Um, however, if we wanted that um, added, so if we did a cost-benefit analysis and found out that we really need um, an X-ray machine there, we, we have the ability to place one. But the benefit is um, having this location and them being able to look at quality metrics and pricing of uh, providers, they could recommend a provider for an x-ray that is a non-hospital um, so that it, it could be at a lower cost to the employee and to the plan. And uh, are records readily available to their regular practitioner? Their Correct. They would do record sharing whenever, whenever there is a relationship, um, so whenever possible they would um, share the electronic medical record. They would also want the same from that provider. So if they're sending it to a specialist, then they would want the specialist results back. So then when the employee is back in for another visit, they can see the follow-up on that information. 
Uh, several years ago, a, a number of us, I'm probably going back four or five years, did a, uh, a trip to the Kansas City area. And I think, I don't know if Christy would agree, but uh, the Kansas City area uh, is doing a lot better than we are in thinking differently yes. uh, in terms of on-site and near-site clinics. We were really, it was a wellness, to learn about wellness as we were trying to expand our wellness program. And one of the things that the independent school district, North uh, Kansas City, Park Hill, all those districts, kind of the, north, the center and north, Lee Summit, one of their comments was that, uh, that it was so beneficial from the standpoint of, of staff not missing a whole day. Daddy made reference to that. And that their staff, and it was, it, now these were, to Chrissy's point before, uh, it took a while, but uh, their staff would really uh, were be able to go, and several, some of their clinics were on-site, but some were near-site, and were able to you know, take care of their business and maybe you know, be gone two hours. And so there wasn't a full day gone from the school. So I think, I think there's one benefit here. We, we, we have staff that have to, as Patty said, take, take a whole day. So I think there's some real opportunities here for our staff and for us as a district to uh, think about cost savings. And, uh, and our staff doesn't want to be gone. They don't want to have to miss, because it's, it's, but uh, sometimes they have no choice because of the way the medical scheduling works. And this doesn't apply to children and or spouses. So anyone that is a member on our plan could be. Mm -hmm. um, so most likely not children under the age of two. Um, and most, most employees um, have a relationship with their pediatrician, but certainly um, for acute care um, and anything else over the age of two, that as long as they're a member on the plan, they'd be able to, to go. And that's why it's so important to have multiple locations so that it's near where you live versus near where you work. So, so Patty, I'm sorry, I just had a pop-up question in my head about with the x-rays and they have to be on our plan. Is there a coordination of benefits between the United Healthcare plan and this or is that going to be... That's a great question. So um, this is just essentially a provider. So we would actually just get a bill from them for the actual costs um, on a, a regular basis, whether that's monthly or, or biweekly, um, however that's set up. So to Sam's point, if somebody needed an x-ray, mm -hmm. they could go to, they wouldn't have to, they could still go somewhere that is covered under oh, absolutely. current United Healthcare plan. They don't, absolutely. They're not being mandated to go to another provider under this this system here. Nope. They not, can go no. to what's Our United Healthcare plan, all those providers are covered in here. And they would accept the physician's prescription for going to that particular location because you usually need some Correct. kind of a referral to go. Correct. And something like that done. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So the discussion more was on the cost. So they that physician would probably be able to explain why going to um, the x-ray at um, BJC may be more costly than going to an x-ray at um, Metro Imaging. Mm -hmm. So they could maybe show the cost differential um, on the plan. Patty, thank you and Amy and Brian for the tremendous amount of work that you put into this project. I know that you really devoted yourself to this and I think our employees will really benefit from it and that, therefore our students will really benefit from it. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Thank you. It was our pleasure in doing, doing this. We truly believe this is the right direction for Parkway. Um, we've looked at this for several years and truly if we would have um, gone through this process three or four years ago, I don't think we would have had the results that we had now. The marketplace is, is a much better place for options like this here in St. Louis now than what it, it was um, just even a few years ago. Well, medical care is changing so quickly. It is. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to a uh, motion and a second that the Board of Education approve CARE ATC as the provider for the Nearsight Healthcare Clinic as outlined in the March 14, 2018 board materials. Roll call, please, Nikki. Mrs. Applebaum? Yes. Ms. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Walker? Yes. Mr. Retto? Yes. Dr. Fiorentino? Yes. Mr. Todd? Yes. Mrs. Feldman? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. 12.0 policy review. There are two up for review, 12.02 personal leave classified staff and 12.02 personal leave non-certificated 
professional supervisory and confidential staff. Are there any questions for Mr. Roguski? Okay, if there are no questions, then these policies will be up for approval at the April 11th, 2018 regular board meeting. And thanks, Phil. <laughs> and um, we'll leave that to, um, to the new board to decide. 13.0 reports, 13.01 uh, Parkway Rockway Community Education Update. We always look forward to having Mike Seppi come and tell us all about our, our communi community education. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for your time tonight. I, I uh, was looking back at my calendar and I think it's been just over two years since I was last here and had given an update, so I'm happy to be here tonight and share kind of a picture as to what's happening with community ed. Um, I hope you like what you see and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So let's go ahead and get started. I thought we, we um, oftentimes folks ask, ask, what is community ed all about? And rather than me stand here and tell you, we've come up with a way to show you. So this is something that we show uh, through our social media, through our website, and, and anyone who's asking. So we'll take a few seconds and watch this. So that's so much better than me standing here and telling you everything that we do in Community Ed, but uh, those are all actual videos from programs that, that actually take place in Community Ed. So just kind of going through, I thought I'd do a little, just a brief overview, um, since again, it's been a couple years since I've been here, so who are we? Um, you may remember all these different colors of the different logos up there, but there are seven different program areas that fall under Community Ed. That is the Adult Education Literacy Programs, uh, our Aquatics, Outdoor Education, Enrichment, School Age Care, otherwise known as Adventure Club, uh, Sports and Fitness, and Visual and Performing Arts. And you'll remember that that includes um, all ages. And so this is, um, if you ever have a chance to come by the main office where most of our staff are housed, you will find in our hallway up there on the ceiling what we've put together as our pledge. So this is something that our staff see every morning when we come into work, and I'll just read it very briefly for you. Uh, at Community Ed, we constantly strive to make programs more enriching, accessible, and engaging so our participants have the best experience possible while learning and having fun. And I hope that you saw in that video that ended with uh, Community Ed is where learning and fun meet. That is what we're all about. And so where are we in Community Ed? Uh, we are in four, year four, believe it or not, we are in year four of the 10-year partnership between Parkway and Rockwood School Districts. Um, what I like to say now that we've entered year four, uh, we've kind of entered the phase of community ed where we're in a continuous improvement phase. We've moved from startup, so you'll remember starting adventure club sites, bringing in sports programs, bringing in uh, various programs and getting them started in one or the other district. We've now kind of moved from a, from a standpoint of all of that get it up, get it up and running, to now how do we make it better? And so that's really where we're, we're at, and I will tell you it's a great place to be. So now what we're looking at every day is how do we not only do what we do, how do we do it better? Um, so our goal is to continue to enhance and expand opportunities for patrons. 
And so as we look at last fiscal year, which was FY17, just a couple quick numbers here, we won't go through everything, but kind of uh, what I'll call our most visual uh, uh, programs. Overall, there were just over 45,000 registrations in community ed. It's important to remember that, that registrations, um, that looks a little different by program area. So think of it more as seats sold. So for example, in our Learn to Swim program, someone might sign up six sessions in a row. That's six seats sold. So 45,000 doesn't necessarily mean unique users, it means seats sold. Um, for example, out at Babbler State Park, uh, with the partnership that we have with the state, they require us to um, account um, attendance a little bit differently. So if someone comes out for a full week-long program, we have to count them every day that week as a user. So that would be five seats sold. So uh, just to give you a sense of every program area kind of has a little bit of its own personality in terms of when we're looking at registrations. Uh, but as we look at uh, Parkway Adventure Club, which of course is the largest program of community ed, um, you'll, you'll recall that when the uh, partnership first started, we started with nine sites of the 18 elementary schools. Um, and then in FY17, we jumped from nine sites to 18 sites. So you'll see the, pr the uh, progression of, of enrollment numbers there. Um, and what that is, those are total contracts. So that doesn't mean that that's um, at any, any one time, that's how many people are in the program. It means throughout a given year, that's how many people entered into a contract for a venture club. So maybe they only needed it for two months of the year rather than a full school year. But what you're looking at there are total contracts for Adventure Club and the Parkway Adventure Club sites. I don't, want to, I don't want to interrupt your role, but uh, I think we've talked about this. I think the most we ever had in the Y program was like 700. Wasn't it? I think so. You know, yeah. the information data we had from the Y was a little bit hard to, to completely understand, but but we think it was somewhere around 700. So we were more than doubled what we used to have in the uh, Y program. That's, that's that's significant. Aftercare in the Parkway area, like mine. I think it's because the Adventure Club has put them out of business it wasn't that was not the intent <laughs> no, no no that's fine but they did that yeah. but i just think that that's i mean that's not surprising what i'm seeing here that they decided that they didn't need to provide that service because it was provided elsewhere mm -hmm. so and so that FY18 uh, number there, that is as of about last week, right before I submitted this application. So it's very possible there's a few more since last week. And then just looking at the sports leagues, that was just to give you an idea. Those are kind of our um, biggest sports programs, our recreational instructional leagues. And you'll see that since FY15, which was the first year of the partnership, those um, have steadily continued to grow in participation. So th this is a slide I think is, is uh, oftentimes when, when we talk to folks and they say, what's community all about? And then we, they say, how do you do that? I thought, well, it might be interesting to talk to a little bit about how we make this all happen. Um, so in the course of uh, a given fiscal year, we will work with more than 500 staff staff in community ed. Now that um, includes full-time, part-time, seasonal, so and it varies throughout the year. As you might imagine, summer is a busy time when we're staffing up for programs. Obviously, at the start of the school year with Adventure Club staffing up. Um, so over 500 staff uh, in a given year. In addition to that, we work with several uh, community groups to bring in programs opportunities for patrons. So in any given year, we will work with 30 to 40 different what we call collaborative partners. So some examples of that would be the Empassant Chess Club, which is probably one of the most popular after-school programs at the Parkway Elementary Schools. Um, Linda Koenig, uh, she runs our adult day trips, so if you've, they're very, very popular. Uh, we work with her and she runs those. And then Mad Science is probably just a program that you have heard of. So uh, again, in any given year, 30 to 40 different collaborative partners um, that will work with. With. And then it always amazes me when I look and say, how do we make these sports programs run? These leagues are all staffed by volunteer parents who want to coach. And, and in any given year, there's over 450 parents who volunteer to, to run those sports leagues on that previous slide that I showed you. So that in itself is quite an undertaking. But kudos to the, to the many, many parents who come out and help us make this happen. Certainly we could not do that without them. This is probably my most favorite uh, uh, slide of the presentation. Uh, originally, I was scheduled to come last month, and then, then we moved to this month, which, which worked out just well. Um, and so last month, what I did is I wanted to just give you a, a, a day in the life of community ed. 
And so I kept it at last month's date because Rockwood is on spring break this week. And so the numbers would look a little bit weird if I tried to give you um, what today looked like. So looking at last month's board meeting date, uh, which was my original intent, on that given day, which was a Wednesday, there were over 6,000 participants in a community app program. Now most of that, probably two thirds of that was Adventure Club, as, as, as you might imagine. Um, but, but, but there was still a significant number beyond that, whether that was through our adult and literacy, aquatics, arts, sports, or uh, fitness and enrichment uh, classes. This is my favorite part. So we often talk about how community ed is, is kind of the department that has the ability to connect with all segments of, of the district population. So I took a look at who participated that day. Our youngest participant was a 13-month-old child taking a Learn to Swim program, and our oldest participant was 86 years old taking a beginning Spanish class. So that just gives you an idea of the broad spectrum of participants on any given day that might be utilizing a community ed program. And then we were at, on that specific day, well over 35 locations. So now we just kind of look at, as I mentioned, it's been two years since I had been here, so I thought I'd kind of give you a brief overview of some of the things that have been happening. And I hope when I go through this, you'll, you'll kind of hear that theme where I was talking about we've moved from startup to continuous improvement. So as I mentioned, all 18 Adventure Club sites are up and running. Um, we did launch a new uh, spring volleyball league, uh, which has now in two years become bigger than our fall volleyball league. As you might recall, the Parkway and Rockwood AEL programs are now combined and they are administered here out of Parkway. The grants are held here in Parkway uh, and the staff are uh, housed over at Fern Ridge. Our experiential trip programs, uh, which we call Trek and Travel, have continued to expand. Uh, specifically this summer, we started a new trip for students that are currently uh, in grades seven and eight that will be going into eight and nine. Um, it's called Atlantic Coastal Quest. We'll be taking them for a week to the uh, Virginia coast where they'll do marine science. Um, and it's just a wonderful opportunity for them um, in addition to the other trips that we have already in place. And then additionally, if you, if you cycle back to the younger kids, our first trip takes place as a parent-child fourth grade trip to the, we call it Ozark Rocks. And we've added, uh, based on demand, added a third date for that. So that's where parents can come and do a, a one, um, two day, one night trip down to the Ozarks. Um, and we kind of give them a taste of what the experiential trips are looking like so that as their kids continue to get older, uh, hopefully they'll have confidence in what what we have to offer. Um, you know, one of the things we do in community is we're always willing and, and, and happy to help with mission support of a district. And so uh, an example of where we're doing that is last year we started partnering with Jennifer Stanfill uh, through the Parkway Choice Programming and utilizing the community ed online registration system for Parkway Summer School. Um, and so we just, um, about a month ago, opened the second year of that, and, and it went really, it's been going fantastic this year. So we're happy to do that, happy to be a part of, uh, help with that service for, for Parkway families. And then uh, last thing on this slide is I, s I meet monthly with the Parkway Facilities team because outside of the schools, Community Ed probably utilizes facilities more than anyone else in the district. And so it's important that we keep a good relationship with the facilities team. And so I meet with them monthly and we sort of uh, be proactive about uh, addressing any, any items that might be on either of our itinerary. And then um, within the last two years, we did take a site visit up to Minnesota. Minnesota is where the, the community ed started. And so we took, I took my whole leadership team up there. We visited four different school districts that are um, what would be considered kind of um, nationally achieving community ed districts, visited with them to learn from them. And that was a great experience. We were also able to share with them what we do. Um, we continue to centralize our operations tasks and what that means is make sure that we allow our programmers to program and deliver programming and take things off um, that would, we would consider operations and give that to our operations team so that they can uh, handle registration, phone calls, things like that. Um, we recently completed an adult program needs assessment and what that looked like was going out into the community and, and giving them some um, themes of, of opportunities of programming and getting their feedback on what they would like to see. Um, and that was a process that took a few few months, um, but it worked, what, what it did was, was allowed us to hear from the community what they would like to see. So just some examples of what has come out of that. Um, we started a new water walking uh, older adult aquatics program, which is very popular. They don't actually walk on water, it's just called water walking. 
um, additional cooking classes, uh, parent-child classes, we're hearing over and over again, parents want more parent-child classes, and, and we're happy to, to deliver on that. And then finally, we are starting over uh, Labor Day weekend, we'll be offering a family camp program, an overnight program out of Babbler State Park. Um, internally, CE staff news. You mentioned you, you heard me say we have over 500 staff. So we know we knew that we need to do a better job communicating to those staff because oftentimes they don't realize who else is in community yet. So we started an internal communication with those folks where we communicate every other month just kind of happenings and important information that they need to know about being in community yet. Learning Resources Network is what I'll call our professional development opportunity. It's the group that we work with to, to get better with lifelong learning. Uh, we were recently recognized with a, an award for our last summer's uh, marketing efforts on, on our marketing programming. Um, consistent evaluation of programs, that's really important for us. So uh, starting with this, this winter spring program, so as of January now, we evaluate after all of our programs are over, and we ask two consistent questions to everyone that participates. The first one, we ask a couple questions, but two that are consistent are whether or not you or your child enjoyed their experience in the program, and would you recommend it to a friend? Uh, we know that being a fee-based um, entity, that there's a lot of opportunities for folks to spend their discretionary dollars elsewhere. So we need to make sure that we're meeting the expectations that they have for us. So we will be able to look across all of our program areas now and have that baseline data and see where we're, we're doing great, where we can do better. And then finally, um, we know to make community ed happen, it takes a lot. It takes a lot beyond community ed. There are a lot of great people in Parkway schools, a lot of great people in Rockwood schools who help us every day, from the custodians on up to Dr. Marty and, and to you, Board of Education. And so what we, we started in January is what we're calling internally the community ed champion series, and what that does is um, once a month now during the school year, we're going to go out and just, just quickly recognize someone who, who, who helps our efforts. And so we'll rotate that by month between Rockwood and Parkway schools. Uh, we just did our first Parkway person uh, last month, and if you can see that picture from that far away, who better than to recognize as our first community ed champion than Paul Tandy? Um, for those of you that have been around a few years, you know Paul and I kind of started way back in a meeting way back in 2011 having some conversations, so we are happy to recognize Paul with that. Okay, I'm almost finished here. Um, I know it's been a long night, so I appreciate your time. Um, so what's up next? What's up next is summer 2018. If you haven't looked in your mail, you should have gotten your program guide by now. You'll notice that it's bigger than it's ever been. We have a lot more programs this year. In fact, just our new programs alone, we have over 100 new programs that we're bringing in addition to kind of the returning favorites. Um, I will tell you, I looked today, that says over 1,500 registrations to date. We are almost at 1,700, so just in a week, we've, we've We've gone up about another 200. Uh, so they are coming in strong. We're happy to, to, to take those registrations. Um, in Parkway, you may recall that during the summer, we do not start offering programs in a Parkway location until summer school is complete. Um, and so that'll start uh, the last week of June, uh, once Parkway summer school is complete. There are opportunities in Rockwood schools that Parkway families, if they choose not to be, uh, for whatever reason, part of Parkway summer school, they can participate in community ed programs in another location. But we do not start in Parkway locations till summer school is complete. And then we do run kind of what, just a, as a benefit to all patrons, um, call it an early bird, call it whatever you want, but prior to May 1st, we do have a code that parents can use that when they register, they can save 10% on almost all programs. Okay, last slide. What, what's coming up? Looking ahead, FY18 and beyond. Lots going on here. Um, for those of you that have been around, and I know Dr. Marty's been around, um, this has been uh, a target of ours for quite some time, having an advisory team uh, made up of community members that we can lean on and, and seek some guidance, feedback, and, 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 and work with them. That is on the radar. In fact, we're currently in the process of identifying kind of the first members of that advisory team. I will tell you we would like to have a board member from each district. So if anyone is passionate about community ed, I would love to have you and you can let us know. Um, we, you, you heard me talk about the adult needs assessment. We're actually gonna do the same process with our summer programs once this summer is complete. So we're gonna take a look um, and, and hear from the community what they would like to see in summer program offerings. 
Um, a big thing that we've been starting and working on, and this is quite a process, is uh, defining our participation guidelines and our accommodations criteria. We know that we want to be as inclusive as possible in our programs. All of our programs, however, have some baseline of participation criteria. And so we've been working with uh, Robin Wallen and Alyssa Gratz here in Parkway, as well as their counterparts in Rockwood, to start defining what that looks like. Um, and so that we also work with the attorneys from both districts on that. So our first process was we worked through Adventure Club. And so we have some um, information that now will be included in the parent handbook, just those uh, participation guidelines and accommodations criteria that we have. Our next step is to do that with the TRIP programs that I mentioned, because those present some unique um, um, opportunities that we need to think through how can we best accommodate those who might have some special needs. And then staffing needs. If you know anyone who needs a job, we're hiring. Doesn't matter if, we, we know, if you know anyone, we are hiring. We're always hiring. And we're always hiring for adventure club. If you know anyone that wants to work with kids, uh, we are always hiring for adventure clubs. It is true <laughs> that as the economy gets better, it gets harder for us to staff because there are lots of job opportunities. You know, our entry level jobs are $9, $10 an hour. There's a lot of competition in the marketplace for that. So um, inevitably, I can assure you, we're constantly working on hiring, but we're always in need of more staff. Um, and then one of the things we're looking at um, to start would be potentially an FY20. You heard me mention about uh, accommodations criteria. We are seeing an increased number in participants who have special needs, and we're happy to do the best that we can to accommodate, and we work really hard to do that. Um, but we're starting to see a need for maybe what we're currently calling an inclusion specialist on our staff that can really help us think through and maybe be an expert in that area and help us think through what we might need to do to best serve those who might have special needs. So that's probably something that you're gonna be hearing come from us next year at this time as we prepare our staffing for needs for FY20. Um, continue to centralize operation tasks. As I mentioned, we're continuing, we're kind of in this continuous improvement. We are looking to continue to grow. I mentioned we take a lot of space. And I can only, I can't say enough how appreciative we are of all the staff and administrators in the schools. Mike Roth, who has the pleasure of working with me on a regular basis um, and making this happen because without the support of the buildings and Mike and everyone else, this just couldn't happen. So we're so appreciative of that. And then finally, as Community Ed is kind of now up and running in Parkway, you may recall one of the things we talked about um, as we get this going and as um, revenue is generated, if and when there are opportunities where we end the year uh, with additional funds. Uh, we are working with Parkway Finance to identify ways to reinvest those dollars. Um, so you may recall um, in Rockwood, there's a process in place uh, where we've been doing that for several years and things like gym floors in elementary schools. And so we are excited about working with Patty as we move forward so that if and when there are opportunities to do that, we'll, we'll be ready to go. So, this is my last slide. Before I finish and answer any questions you have, I would be remiss if I didn't just take one quick minute. Um, I know there are two board members who are gonna be cycling off here in the next uh, few weeks. And both of you have been around um, since kind of the beginning of, of Community Ed. So, um, please accept my sincere appreciation and thanks for all of your support uh, for, for the last many years. It's been quite a journey um, and we really appreciate all of your support over the years. So thank you so much. I was gonna give you all these wonderful compliments <laughs> about how you lived up to every promise that you made us, how you've worked with us as a wonderful partner, you personally and you, the Rockwood District. Um, I, if there were big glitches in the rolling out of the first nine and then the second nine adventure clubs, um, you managed to fix whatever the problems were because from where we sit, it was pretty flawless and those t just two huge undertakings. And to think about the number of kids that the program is serving now, I think it's really doing a wonderful service for our kids and for our parents. So thank you. Uh, you know, you're the... You're the, you're the quiet child. We don't really hear from you very often, but you're doing so much in the background. So back at you. We really appreciate your hard work. Thank you. I appreciate that. And your that. staff. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Beth, I, I just, I just, I just, I just want to echo that because uh, Mike's heard me sometimes be concerned about things, uh, and I'll go visit with him, and, and he's the kind of individual that listens and says, well, let's work on it. And uh, I think the same has been true when you've had some concerns about space and whatever. He's come and Mike Roth and others, uh, Paul, 
And so it, it's it's wonderful relationship because while we can be pretty frank with each other about concerns, there's never about we're going to work on it. And uh, you're right, Mike has just been a wonderful uh, person to partner with because he he's always. Uh, of course, very optimistic and uh, and always wanting to just keep improving. That continuous improvement he talked about is very sincere. He, he really is uh, about uh, always getting better. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, one other thing, um, I guess not for me and Kim, but for the other board members, I think they might be interested in seeing your community education um, newsletter. Sure. We, we Absolutely. all really like mm -hmm. um, you sure. know, knowing what's going on internally. Yeah. It's a great so, idea. Yeah. So yeah, we'll add you in. Yep. So every other month. Get ready. Mike, Mike do you want to speak to su seat. Summer Expo for a second? How many, sure. Yeah, just how many? Yeah, so Summer Expo, um, what that is, is we do that once a year. Uh, typically, it's the it's the Sunday between Super Bowl and President's Day weekend. <laughs> and um, that is an opportunity where we basically invite all of our competition in um, and run a community event because we know that, that it's bigger than us. And what we do is provide an, um, more than 100 exhibitors who will come in who offer summer programming for the community. Uh, and that is a free event to parents so they can come in and learn about pretty much anything that's out there. Uh, the, we, we are right at each, for the last two, two, three years, we're averaging right around 2,000 people show up on that day. Um, and we rotate that between uh, West High and Marquette High School. So this year it was a West High. Next year we'll be moving, we're moving back to Marquette. But it's a wonderful um, community event where, where parents can come. And I will tell you, usually starting in like December, we start to get questions about when it is and, and where's it gonna be this year, so. Mike, I just wanted to say thank you for including the special needs kid because this is a great program and it would be very nice if all can be part of it. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very great. much. Thank you so much. Turn the page too fast. I think I was at 14.0 work session. There is none. 15.0 call for a special meeting. There is none. 16.0 next scheduled closed session. The next anticipated closed session will be held on Wednesday, April 11th at 6 p.m. at Parkway Central Middle School. Details of the closed session will be posted within 24 hours of the anticipated meeting. 17.0 recess, 18.0 closed session. We will return to closed session, but may I have a motion and a second to adjourn the regular meeting? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance.